John Bonet Ramsey. She was strangled with a cord. Little Miss Colorado. Six-year-old murder victim John Bonet Ramsey. Unknown intruder. Her brother. John Bonet Ramsey. not interviewed the parents. I didn't do it. John Ramsey didn't do it. And he didn't have a clue of anybody to do this. My life has been hell from that day forward. And I want nothing more than to find out who was responsible for this. Thank you for the beautiful trailer for this week here, Captain, and thank you for playing Patsy's 911 call. Now, just to clear up any type of confusion, I think we should jump right into a a transcript of that 911 call so we can all have a clear understanding what is said on both ends from the 911 operator as well as Patsy Ramsey. When 911 picks up the call, Patsy Ramsey says, police, 911, what's going on, ma'am? Patsy Ramsey, 755 15th Street. What's going on there, ma'am? Patsy, we have a kidnapping. Hurry, please. 911, explain to me what's going on, okay? Patsy, there we have a, there's a note left and our daughter's gone. 911, a note was left and your daughter's gone? Patsy, yes. 911, how old is your daughter? She is six years old. She's blonde, six years old. How long ago was this? Patsy, I don't know. I just got the note and my daughter's gone. 911, does it say who took her? Patsy, what? 911, does it say who took her? Patsy, no, I don't know. There's a, there's a ransom note here. 911, it's a ransom note? Patsy, it says SBTC, victory, please. 911, Okay, what's your name? Are you Kath? Patsy. Patsy Ramsey. I'm the mother. Oh my God, please. 911. Okay, I'm sending an officer over, okay? Patsy, please. 911. Do you know how long she's been gone? No, I don't. Please, we just got up and she's not here. Oh my God, please. 911. Okay, Cal. Patsy, please send somebody. 911. I am, honey. Patsy, please, 911, take a deep breath in. Patsy, she says, hurry, hurry, hurry. 911 says, Patsy, Patsy, Patsy. At the start of this call, it appears that Patsy Ramsey is asking for the police. Now, we only hear her say police. There are some reports that state that that is inaudible, that we cannot tell what Patsy is saying in that first line. Yeah, and there's some people that speculate that she actually goes to say ambulance and cuts herself off and says police. She's immediately asked what is going on, to which she responds giving her address 
Again, what is going on there, ma'am? She states, we have a kidnapping. Hurry, please. What I decipher from this very quick little snippet at the beginning of the call Mm -hmm. is I kind of think good and bad when we look at the, the scales of justice in regards to Patsy Ramsey. She's doing exactly what I would expect a mother who is terrified as, at what could be going on. Her daughter is gone and found a ransom note. Right. She is asking for the type of help that she needs, police. She is asking she is stating where she is located and immediately dis- stating the problem at hand. We have a kidnapping and then asking hurry please. We've gone through a lot of these 911 calls over the years. Yeah, they drive me nuts. One thing that I've always called into question is when we have a lengthy call and the person is failing to ask for help to respond to the situation until later in the call. Right. Here, this call roughly is about, I was trying to time it. It's roughly, it's a little over a minute. A minute and 42 seconds or something. And We have within seven seconds of the call, she is actually asking for help. She's asking for someone to respond to the scene. Right. So I think a good sign for Patsy, where I say that I think a bad sign for Patsy is, and this might be just too much speculation on my part, but it almost appears to me in somewhat of a manner that she believed that she could ask for the type of help that she wants, police or ambulance. She states where they are located and states the problem at hand, the kidnapping. Part of me wonders if she thought that the conversation was going to go any further than that. Right. That, okay, now I'm off the hook. I've made this call. I've told them the help that we need. Let's wait for them to respond. Very good here. We have the 911 operator asking again, explain to me what is going on. Okay. One thing that I will point out that I think is good for Patsy Ramsey here. Is and when you mean good, good in the sense that she, let's say she's innocent of any wrongdoing, mm-hmm. she goes immediately into we have a there's a note left and our daughter's gone, meaning where my first suspicion was that this this conversation was going to be over as soon as she said there's a kidnapping please hurry right, then she's asked what is going on she without hesitation goes into what is going on. She doesn't stumble, you know, like I would expect somebody that has a lot to hide to possibly stumble at that point in the conversation. A lot of, yeah, a lot of, uh, uh, um, and then there's several back and forth about, you know, our daughter's gone and there's a note here. She gives a brief description. It's six years old. She's blonde. She's a six year old girl. Yeah. A lot of people give her a check mark in the, in the guilty column for never saying her daughter's name. But in fairness to Patsy Ramsey, she's never asked what the daughter's name is. How old is she? Correct. What's your name? Correct. And then we do have a portion here where I find it interesting that 911 is, okay, what's your name? Are you Kath? So there's several several, um, versions of this call out there. Right. Uh, I find this one to be the most complete one that I have seen. And so I'm going with this one. I hear her say, the operator say, are you Kath? Which just, I find that interesting because it doesn't, she doesn't seem to know where the call's coming from at that time. Almost like she's going to ask her, are you Kathleen or Kathy? Right. But yeah, I, I think it's probably just inaudible and, and that's the closest somebody could down to decipher so i have patsy ramsey of course she's asking for help numerous times asking that they please hurry numerous times throughout this call but even in this very short call six or seven seconds into it is the first time that she asked for help and then again around the 40 second mark and basically the whole second half of the call is her asking for help or for them to please hurry so where I always stand on those is if we have a situation where somebody calls 911 and they are not asking for help because that's essentially that's all 911 is there for. For you to call and request help, assistance of some sort. 
Yeah, my issue with a lot of these 911 calls is is just the the lack of calmness and and obviously that's easier said than done. But yes, you read the note, you yelled for your husband, you ran to your husband, you had some kind of conversation with your husband. He reads the note, then he says, "Hey, call police." Which one of of the two individuals, we know which one's calmer, John Ramsey. So maybe you should call because like you said, after you ask for help, maybe that's where you think it should stop. It's normally where it doesn't stop. So no, 911 is going to keep you or whoever calls on the line as long as they can, unless you have really good reason to not be on the call. Yeah. And this, this call also gets put into question because I would think when you start talking to somebody and saying, Hey, we have an emergency. Here's where we're at. By me talking to you, the reason why they keep you on the phone is to start calming you down. So as you as the call progresses, Patsy doesn't get more calm. I think this, to me, is either a sign that she's faking it and she's a drama queen, or this is happening in real time and this happens so quickly and as they're asking her questions, she's still processing the fact that her kid is gone. And what the hell are we going to do? Yeah. And one of the things that I find really interesting, and I believe John Douglas talks about this, is one of the key things that he believes that she didn't know much about the note. And we'll go get to the note later. But a lot of people speculate that she wrote it. Well, if she wrote it and they said, who's the note from that? If she was really familiar with the note, she would have just said SBTC, but it's almost like she has to flip to that part of the note. And then she reads from down to upwards. Mm -hmm. She reads SBTC. That makes no sense. So she goes to the next word to try to find the answer. SBTC. Nope, that's not a good answer. Victory. Oh, that's not a good answer either. See what I'm saying? So if somebody is more familiar with the note, they, they probably wouldn't have read from down to up. Probably wouldn't have had to flip to the back uh, to the third page to find the answer. That's assuming that, that she's doing that. But it sounds like the way she's describing things on that 911 call, it sounds as if that is in fact what she is doing. Yeah, it'd be very good acting, I would think, if she's faking that. Well, you said drama queen. I do believe she took some uh, drama courses, mm -hmm. be it in high school or college. I, but here's what it drives me nuts is like, on the, we're always constantly going, well, here's how I would have reacted, or this is how I think somebody should react. Where Because if you did, if John Ramsey called and said, my name is John Ramsey. My my daughter, John Benet Ramsey, is missing. She's six years old. She's blonde. She's about however tall. That they would persecute him for being too calm and not being emotional enough. Right. Well, I to me, I don't try to look too much into the, to try to figure out the emotions of the person making the call. I never do that. My whole thing is just, I always question when they are finally asking for help, because that's, right. that's what 911 is. It's truly a lifeline. It is there only to be asking for help. And when somebody is in a situation as severe as this, I expect them to be asking for help very quickly in the call. And the reason why I always reference that is because if it's a put on, if you're only calling 911, because you feel that that's what you are supposed to do or how you are supposed to act in this situation and you, in fact, did something terrible, then really you don't want help to show up. Inside, deep down inside, you, you're you hoping it's delayed as possible because you don't want to have to explain anything to anyone right? because you don't want them to know what you've done. So I always take that into account when I, when I listen to these. I never try to listen to the emotion because as you very... Uh, very well pointed out, we don't know how each one of us would behave or react to these different situations. We, there is no right way to 
act or wrong way to behave on these calls. And the call gets a little more interesting at the end because there is no, okay, see you later, or we'll be here waiting. There's no end. And that's where I believe possibly at that point, John Ramsey is trying to tell Patsy Ramsey something. There's something going on at that house that is pulling her attention away from the phone call. And and at that point going that minute and 40 some seconds on the phone to that mother could have felt like an hour. So she might've been like, look, I said all I need to say. Now there's stuff going on here. Mm -hmm. And now I'm talking to these individuals, then the phone hangs up. And it's always been kind of a mystery what has been said at the end. This is from a 2016 story on bustle.com. There's long been debate over what exactly happened at the tail end of the, of the recording with some arguing the call did not immediately disconnect after Patsy hung up the receiver and that a third voice can be heard. The 911 tape has been analyzed nine times, nine different times, by everyone from the FBI to the U.S. Secret Service to professional audio laboratories to CBS to an amateur Internet sleuth. Neither the FBI or the Secret Service have reported hearing a third voice or any other extended conversation. Now, if we back up a few years before this 2016 story on bustle.com from Steve Thomas's book. We have this from page 15. The telephone call gave us a cornerstone of evidence. When he says us, he means the bolder detectives working the case, not so much for what was easily heard, but for what was found when experts washed out the background noise. It has been my experience as a police officer that such emergency calls are virtually unchallengeable. They are tape recorded and either something was said or it is not. Right. Tapes can be so powerful that prosecutors regularly play them so a jury can hear the actual voices and emotions of the participants. In preliminary examinations, detectives thought they could hear some more words being spoken between the time Patsy Ramsey said, hurry, 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 and when the call was terminated. However, the FBI and the U.S. Secret Service could not lift anything from the background noise on the tape. As a final effort several months later, we contacted the electronic wizards at the Aerospace Corporation in Los Angeles and asked them to try to decipher the sounds behind the noise. Their work produced a startling conclusion. Patsy, apparently having trouble hanging up the telephone, and before it rested in the cradle, She was heard to moan, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus. Her husband was heard to bark, we're not talking to you. And in the background was a young sounding voice, what did you find? According to Steve Thomas, he says this young sounding voice was John Bonet's brother, Burke. The Ramseys would repeatedly tell us, again meaning the detectives, that their son did not wake up at any point throughout the night of the crime. He says we knew differently. Yeah, but there's there's so many problems with all this. I mean, CBS did the analysis on this to eliminate all the background noise is nearly impossible. So I don't care what kind of state of the art system you have. Um, it's that's just not how audio works. There's distortions and 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 things that are happening naturally because it's a phone call that you're not going to be able to eliminate. So, and I, again, I think these are, it's one of these dumb points that, okay, if you prove that she's saying, you know, Jesus, Jesus, help me, Jesus or whatever. And then you hear in the background, which I hear something like that. And then I also hear some other noise, which they're claiming is, John Ramsey, and he's saying to then Burke, and when you watch the CBS special, I think they do a good job to go, okay, that's possible. There was also speculation for a couple years after that that she was saying 
um, what have I done? So there's been all these, you know, different accounts of what she's saying. Okay, let's just say that you're saying what CBS is saying and, and what, what the detectives are saying is true. And then they came to you and said that, well, Burke wasn't up. So we don't, we don't know. Well, we know that Burke had to wake up at some point and we know that Burke was awake by the time the police got there. So what does it prove other than their misremembering and there's plenty of detectives and plenty of law enforcement and plenty of FBI agents that have looked at this case and said, you know, just let's take a step back. When Patsy Ramsey says, well, I checked in on John Bonet and then I went down the steps and then it later changes to, I went down the steps, saw the note, then I went to check on her. That could be in that moment of trauma if she has no involvement and in her daughter going missing, she might never remember which order it happened. She is just telling you the best of her ability, what she thinks happened. So take that same scenario. Uh, Burke wasn't up when I was on the 911 call. Well, maybe you're misremembering. Maybe because of the trauma, because of all the stuff going on in your head and in the house that, um, uh, he wasn't up when you went to make the call. He was up when you hung up the phone. We'll continue along on the timeline uh, as we go here. But according to eyewitness reports, Burke Ramsey did not wake up until after police had arrived on the scene. I want to jump back here, Captain, before we get into this timeline a little more, because I want to really focus in on something that you said regarding that that tail end of the call, what has been called into question and has been a debate of what was said, if something was said and what was really going on. I think there's good reason to debate that. I think there's good reason for people to question what they believe that they're hearing. Part of it is the reports that are out there. Depending on who you look at depends on what report you get on what is, if in fact anything, at the tail end of that call. Right. I personally cannot hear, I hear something. I can't hear the words that are said. I believe what I'm hearing is at least two different voices, but right. I wouldn't say, but to get, to I, have I wouldn't this. bet my, I wouldn't bet the title of my vehicle on that. I'm hearing three different voices. I think I hear three things going on, but I don't know that for certain that I hear three different voices. So the way that this would work out is that Patsy didn't hang up the phone all the way. And then these words are spoken again. I find it interesting that we have so many different, let's call them scientists for a lack of better words, right? So many different scientists coming out and saying, Oh, we did this to the audio. We did that to the audio. And this is what we heard. Oh, we didn't hear anything. We can't clean it up. We did clean it up. Varying reports, uh, according to Bustle.com, at least nine different agencies took a look at this. Regarding Steve Thomas, I find him to be, I believe him to be, is what I should say, a reputable detective. If he says this is what they found, I do put some weight to that. Where I won't go all in on his statement is this has never been presented in the court of law. And therefore, I have to go with his word. But at the same time, he's saying that all these other different agencies couldn't find anything or couldn't decipher what was being said. Right. And I, like I said, I think you could start saying that you, you hear these words and then you start hearing those words. And if you take a different term, then maybe you start hearing that term. And the audio is just not clear. And there's just not the technology to clean it up to the point where it's definitive that there is another voice. I also, again. Or at least to the point that it's been played in that manner for the public. Right. But I don't understand what the gotcha moment would be. That if The they gotcha had, moment, I would believe that would be that Burke was awake. 
that right. that is a very that's a very uh, pivotal moment in this case. I if don't, he was, I don't in think fact, it is. But why would they lie about that? I'm not saying that they. I, I, again, what I have read from several FBI agents when they say this misremembering or switching up the order of which you did something might not be so nefarious. It just simply might be you have blocked that out that people sometimes when they see their, their child dead for the next couple of hours, it's all a blur. And that's very, it's a very good possibility in this case. And so this idea where people go, well, Burke wasn't up. Well, at five fifty two, you check on him. Is it possible that there's commotion? He comes down, says something. You tell him to go to his room, whatever, and you misremember. And since you misremember, then you double down on on this because we know that we know at some point they become a suspect, and then it seems like they double down on a lot of a lot of things. And I'm just saying, what does it prove? I don't think yeah. it proves anything other than the possibility that they are lying. And I would really call into question what is actually going on in that household and what are they pretending to be doing or pretending is going on if they are, in fact, lying about Burke being awake. Yeah, but I, to me, it would matter more if it was something where it's like, we kind of hear a third voice saying, hey, did you find my sister? I killed her, you know, or something to that effect. But. Uh, a kid going, oh, what did you find? This is, again, the only thing, like you said, which I agree. It, it I find it, it very difficult that, they, that they. I find it very difficult that they would misremember this. I find it more so that it points out that they're lying. When you have some something that indicates possible deception, you then have to call everything else into question. It, it doesn't make them look so credible going forward. The other issue that I take with this is then it calls into question, well, if in fact you are telling the truth and he slept through this whole thing, why didn't you wake him up to ask him any questions? He possibly could have seen something or heard something or offered something of value for the investigation or to the parents who at that point should be calling for help, also should be looking for their daughter or searching the home. Well, again, with the best technology, I think it's too difficult to clean up to say for certain what is said at the end of that tape. All right, welcome back. Cheers. This week we are drinking Citra Noel Hoppy Holiday Ale by Columbus Brewing Company. Garage grade four and a quarter bottle caps out of five. Thanks again to everyone who has contributed to this year's beer fund. Happy holidays out there to everyone in the garage army. After the 911 call. The Ramseys call Fleet and Priscilla White and then call John and Barbara Fernie. There is some dispute about who was called first, but regardless, due to other events in this timeline, we know that the calls were made before 5.59 a.m. As we go forward with the timeline, let's keep in mind that there are different reports having different details within the timeline. There are a lot of moving pieces and a lot of witnesses providing information to fill out that timeline. So we will try to deliver this portion in the most clear and concise manner that we can. At 5.59 a.m., Boulder Police Officer Rick French arrives on the scene. He arrives at the home of John and Patsy Ramsey just before 6 a.m. in a BPD, Boulder Police Department, marked car. What is not in dispute is that the fact that Officer French was the first law enforcement officer to arrive at the Ramsey house. Most reports would have Officer French arriving at 5.59. This is based around him arriving seven minutes after the 911 call, which 911 logged that call at 5.52. 
Some reports have French arriving earlier, and he could have, but that would have to mean that the 911 call log is not correct. At approximately 6 a.m., Officer French reads the ransom letter. In a story based on reading the police reports, Newsweek reporters claim French read the ransom note and later conducted a quick search of the house. In contrast, other reports claim French did the house search first and then read the ransom note. French himself stated in a Vanity Fair interview that after being greeted by Patsy on arrival, John Ramsey directed me through the house and pointed out a three-page handwritten note which was laid on the wooden floor just west of the kitchen area. Sometime after 6 a.m., Officer French searched the basement. Another report states French immediately searched the house, looking for a point of entry. Only after he did that search, he read the ransom note. Detective Steve Thomas's account is far different in terms of timing, stating, with detectives finally on the scene, they arrived at 8 10 a.m. according to thomas to handle witnesses french checked the garage and lower levels of the house looking for places through which the kidnapper might have carried off the child he found none the house was messy but he saw no sign of a struggle that last account comes from the leading detective steve thomas but let's keep in mind while he was one of the leading detectives on the case he was not present at the Ramsey home on the day in question. Regardless of the exact timing of this search, it is important to note, according to police reports, that during this search, the officer fails to search what Ramsey's and later everyone else would refer to as the wine cellar room. From the police reports in French's search of the basement, quote, He came to a door secured with a wooden latch. He paused for a moment in front of the door, but walked away, end quote. He does not enter this room, which would later be called into question. In the police report French filed, he says he didn't open the wine cellar room door because he was looking for exits the kidnapper might have used. This door he deemed to be secure. He noticed the latch was on the wrong side of the door. This meaning for someone leading out of the house. Right. So he kept moving. This is the windowless room that is referred to as the cellar room. And French does not know that there's no windows in that room. That's not why he doesn't open that door. What he determines is that it would be physically impossible for someone to close the door behind them and secure the latch once in the room. Right because the latch would be on the opposite side of the door. While this is all going on, Sergeant Breichenbach arrives and conducts a search. I want to go through this a little bit here, Captain, because as said, there's a lot of moving pieces, and the timing of all of this stuff seems to vary depending on who you talk to. What I think is important to know going forward is most of what I would consider to be the key events I believe them all to have actually happened. What you would call into question is the timing of those events. Right. Not if they occurred or not. It seems like all of the all of the possible witnesses would claim that all of these things do in fact happen. It's just in what order and when. Right. So I put in here Sergeant Reichenbach arrives and conducts a search of the home. The reason why I put it in here is is because if you go from John Douglas's information, he states that both Sergeant Reichenbach and Officer French searched the home before this next event happened. This next event is marked at 6.03 a.m. or minutes after 6. This is when friends Fleet and Priscilla White arrive at the Ramsey house. Within 15 minutes of their arrival, According to Mr. White's later testimony, he alone searched the basement. Fleet White said when he went downstairs to look for John Benet Ramsey, the lights were already on in the basement. Fleet White then searches the train room, or what he would call the playroom. He testified that a window in the basement playroom or train room was broken. Under the broken window, Mr. White states there was a suitcase. 
along with a broken shard of glass. He does not, however, remember whether the window was open or closed. There is a report that states Fleet White moved this suitcase and placed it under the window. Some reports state that this window was open, some say it was closed. Fleet White also opened the door to the wine cellar room, but he could not see anything inside because it was dark. Remember, there's no windows in this room. Right. And he could not find the light switch. Anybody that's familiar with this home and the layout of the home, one thing that's always been called into question is that the light switch for this wine cellar room is in a strange spot. It's not in that go-to spot that one would immediately turn to naturally to flip on the light. Right. He doesn't see anything, and he said he closed the door and secured the latch. Now, according to Steve Thomas, he says at 6.30 a.m., Fleet White searches the basement. Same incident with a slightly different time and description of observations. Thomas's notes state that within approximately 10 to 15 minutes of his arrival, Fleet White searched the basement of the Ramsey's residence. He noticed that the lights were on, saw the broken window in the train room, and looked for broken glass and found a small piece of glass. The latch on the window was in the unlocked position, and his impression was that the window was closed. He looked in the wine cellar but could not see anything and went back upstairs. At 6.10 a.m., Boulder Police Department Officer Carl Veach responds to the scene. Captain, we do need to point out here that contrary to normal protocol, the police did not seal off the home of the Ramses. Yeah, they missed a lot of things with protocol. Yeah. In other words, any person in the Ramsey house could and did move freely throughout the home at this time. This includes officers and the Ramses and the Whites, as we know, Fleet White at some point, even though in dispute of the exact timing, did search the lower level of the home. Well, any time that there's a, a victim that is that young of age, and then you have a ransom note or a kidnapping situation, what I've heard is that you're supposed to go, okay, let's prove this theory first, that the, that the child is not in the house that something didn't happen this in this house and we're not trying to cover it up with with this tactic. And obviously we they didn't do that. They just assumed that this is a kidnapping, a typical kidnapping and 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 we're going to trust the parents on this one and, and and move forward. So there's a few things in that very same regard that I find to be interesting based off of witness statements. And this includes law enforcement and civilians. We have the two officers that Douglas says searched the home before Fleet White. Both of them state that they're looking for exit points from the house. So that Mm -hmm. means you're going to be searching probably the basement and the ground level This might lead them to have no reason, if that's in fact what they are searching for, this might lead them to not have cause to search the second floor and, of course, the third floor. Right. The other thing, we have Fleet White. He states that he is looking for John JonBenet Ramsey. He's, he states that his purpose of searching the home was to look for the little girl. This based off of a real-life situation that, that he experienced where I believe it was his daughter was missing and she was just hiding somewhere. Right. You know, it was just one of those parental scare moments that people have. The difference here is he wouldn't have, there's a ransom note, but I don't believe if, if you believe fleet white's account, he very likely would have no knowledge of this ransom note before he went off on his search. Right. The other thing though, captain, where you talked about protocol and, and the missteps by the Boulder police department, The ransom note says do not contact the police. And one standard bit of protocol, I would guess here, I'm I'm making an assumption. I do not know this to be true. Uh It seems very strange to me that when you are reporting a kidnapping with a ransom note, that Boulder responds by sending a marked police car to the scene. That's the first car that shows up. It seems to me like it would be more beneficial to that exact situation if you would send at least a detective in an unmarked car. Right. So a lot of things going on here. 
I, I say all that, but I also question current day, present day, even 1996, how much experience would a police department have with a kidnapping and a ransom note? That's kind of an old school crime. Yeah. I, I wonder how often the, these protocols are taught. I know that they have kidnappings and they deal with abductions and missing persons cases, but one, in fact, where there's a ransom note saying, hey, this person's going to die unless you give us this money. Well, I just find it so strange how many people the parents called to say, hey, look, John Bonet is missing. Come over. Come to the house. Yeah, just after 10 a.m. is when family friend John Fernie arrives. His, his wife, Barbara Fernie, came later, and that's reported as just before 6.20 a.m. So we have Fleet White, Priscilla White, John Fernie, Barbara Fernie, all at the Ramsey house as of 6.20 a.m. This is about a half hour after the 911 call is placed. Right. We also need to keep in mind that not only do we have all these extra civilians in the house, but we also have several officers that have arrived. They're trying to assess what's going on. They're talking to John. They're talking to Patsy. And what John says is that after he was aware that something was wrong, that he did check the first floor doors. He found them all to be locked. He says that the Ramseys, in fact, had a security system, but it was not engaged, and that their dog stayed at a friend's house that night. The dog was not in the house the night in question. John said he saw no signs of forced entry, and the Ramseys say they heard nothing during that night. Yeah, but it, this is where it gets kind of messed up, though, because... You have a situation where a police officer sees marks on like the kitchen door or like the the outside door that would go into the kitchen and they look like fresh, like, like this is maybe attempt to break into your house. And John Ramsey kind of dismisses these like, well, I, I don't know if those are new or old because he has this habit of one forgetting his keys and just breaking stuff to get into his own house mm -hmm. and not fixing it. So that makes this situation even more difficult. Yeah, and I believe they find those marks the, the following day. Now, just before 6.45 a.m., John Ramsey calls the pilot. Remember, they're supposed to be getting on an airplane. John Ramsey leaves a message for his pilot. This is Michael Archuleta who then returns the call a few minutes later and Patsy answers the phone. I don't have record of what was stated. I'm guessing based off of things that Michael Archuleta would later say that it was simply a call to say, Hey, something's wrong. Something's going on here. We're not making that, that plane. Right. At 6:45 AM officer Sue Barclow arrives at the Ramsey's house about this same time. Victim advocates arrive at the Ramsey's house. They are called in as they are advocates trained in helping families through traumatic situations. Mm -hmm. When they arrive, apparently they arrived with bagels and coffee. Priscilla White, about the same time, calls her niece, who is back at the White's house. We will know what that call is about in a bit. At 6.50 a.m., Officer Weiss and Officer Barklow were photographing and fingerprinting areas of the house. Officer Veach had collected the ransom note. At 7 a.m., Burke Ramsey is awakened and dressed. There are two different accounts of how this went down, but they're both very similar. One account states that it was John Ramsey, Fleet White, and Mr. Fernie right. who woke up the young boy and got him dressed and got him ready to go. The other story states that it was just Fleet White and John Ramsey. At 7.13 a.m., Reverend Roll Hoverstock from St. John's Episcopal Church arrives at the Ramsey's home. This is their reverend. This is the church that they attend. After the reverend arrives, nine-year-old Burke Ramsey is taken by Fleet White and John Fernie to pick up the Fernie children, presumably at the Fernie home, 
and then taken to the White's home. There was some interaction action during this whole movement of Burke, let's call it. Right. Where police want to ask Burke if he saw anything. Remember, right now we are investigating a kidnapping of a little girl that occurred inside of a home where there was three other people that night. Mm -hmm. Three potential witnesses, whether they saw something, heard something. Right. What the officer is told from all the, and I'm using air quotes here, Captain, general accounts that I have seen states that John Ramsey instructs the officer that Burke was sleeping the entire night and he saw and heard nothing. Basically, he has nothing to offer to this investigation. At an unknown time, John Ramsey apparently searches the basement. Mr. Ramsey also searched this basement area alone, according to some stories. He testified that he found the broken window partially open. Under the broken window, Mr. Ramsey also saw the same suitcase seen earlier by Mr. White, Mr. Ramsey testified that the suitcase belonged to his family, but was normally stored in a different place. Mr. Ramsey then returned upstairs. In his 1998 testimony, John Ramsey provided several different times for when he searched the basement on his own. He first states, quote, it would have been that time period, seven to nine, and later reiterates it was probably sometime between seven and nine. When asked whether it was before or after the Whites and the Fernies arrived, John stated, quote, I think it was after because they came fairly early. He then reiterated, quote, the best I can do is it was, I believe, after the police came because they had gone through the house before I figured out what I'm going to do. It was before 10 o'clock. They had already done some preparation before that. So it would have been before, probably before nine. So then somewhere between seven and nine, but when reminded that the ransom letter said a call would come between eight and 10 AM, right? John is basing these answers off of that. He was misremembering that the call was going to come between 10 and 12, 10 AM and noon, right? As he had supposed, John made clear that he had visited the basement prior to that time since he states, quote, when we were ready for the phone call, I was prepped about what I was going to say and I was getting the family ready. And so between that period of time, we were just waiting for the phone call and I was near the phone and I was either in the study or on the first floor. I was just waiting for it referring to the call. And this is one of the biggest problems with the whole damn case is <laughs> the the misremembering and the eyewitness accounts from everybody. It's almost like you have to kind of throw most of them away because they don't line up with other people's accounts. Mm-hmm. And, it, and, but also this is because you first have to go into the scene and determine whether or not it's a kidnapping. If they would have done their due diligence there, they would have found John Bonet, Ramsey and the wine cellar. Once they find her in the wine cellar, now you have to lock off this scene. Now it's a crime. And now what we need to do is try to, because we know it's like 12 to 1, that somebody that young, if not more, uh, percentage is higher, that somebody in her family killed her. So now you have to separate the three that were in the house and start questioning them right away. And this is not done by law enforcement. Yeah, there. Look, and I hate to come down hard on Boulder Police Department because this is a strange situation. Nobody can doubt that. After we know what we currently know, it's going to get even stranger. But where I kind of fault them is, Captain, I feel like me, you, and some of our garage friends could have showed up to this home and done somewhat of a better job just being uneducated individuals that are just guessing as we go. Yeah. I think the difficult thing here is that you have quote unquote grieving parents. And so therefore, again, it becomes one of those things where it's easier said than done, where you have to assume that 
nobody's telling you the truth from the get go and 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 let the evidence tell you what to believe but i think that's hard to do when you have this mother uh crying and 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 kind of causing a scene well there you're giving us too much credit i'm not even taking it to that level of sophistication i just mean if you show up to what is deemed or believed to be at the time a kidnapping that i feel like there are already missteps just for that just for that kidnapping not even based off of anything else that we will figure out uh, any right, of the right, events right. to come. So I do want to point out by this time, and it is reported again, I apologize to everybody, but I can't make this stuff up. This is what's out there. This is the information that's out there. This is what we have to deal with. There are varying times on this statement as well, but I believe that by this time, I believe the earlier statement, that by this time in our time frame, roughly we are around the seven-ish to 730 mark Mm -hmm. by this time they have done one well two things that were very smart and that you would do in a ransom type situation by this point they have set up a trap and trace on the ramsey's home phone and they've also stopped all police radio communication regarding the kidnapping This is important for several reasons. We have individuals that that claim, or at least the note will claim, that they want a ransom for the safe return of this little girl. They very likely could be monitoring police scanners, listening into what calls are going on to see if the Ramseys, in fact, did contact the police and what the police are doing. What is their movements what is their strategy at this time so they canceled all police radio communications and now they are going to communicate via phone which that's going to complicate matters because they're not used to doing that and not everybody has a phone on their person but that's what they have to deal with now going through All of those things that John Ramsey said about the timing of when he searched the home on his own, searched the basement on his own. We go through that. It's a bit tedious, but you have to go through it because there's going to be a lot of questions about what he could have been doing during that time or when he, in fact, searched the home by himself. We included all of his words so that you know that we're not just making this up. This comes from actual Words. This is from evidence. This is from his statements that he put out himself. Now, if he's giving us a two hour time window when he believes that the ransom call was going to come in between 10 and 12, and he's saying, well, it happened before that, it must have been between seven and nine. You almost wonder if you have to back that up a whole hour because he's off on when the call is supposed to come in. The call is supposed to come in between eight and 10. And he's saying that he's being, he remembers being prepped at some point. And this would be, in his recollection, around the time that the call was supposed to come in. You have to prep the guy before the call comes in, right? All right. So let's simplify some of this. Roughly about 7 o'clock, they're going to wake up Burke. They're going to get him dressed. They're going to take him to the Whites. At the same time, Roughly at the same time, about 7 o'clock to 7.13, we have the reverend showing up. So he's going to get to the house. And then at some point between 7 and 8, probably closer to 7, because John Ramsey has to be prepped for the call, which should be coming in from 8 to 10. He searches the home. He searches the home. In his own words, it's just the timing he gives is weird and wrong because of two things, one of two things, either he's not remembering the events clearly or he's lying or he's lying. Right. But either way, this would put his search before the police officer's search. And so now roughly about seven thirty, and we're looking at, uh, 30 minutes before a call possibly could come in. The ransom amount is assembled. They collect the $118,000. At 7.33 a.m., a canine unit is put on standby. This is interesting, Captain, because they never use this canine unit. They just put one on standby. 
I don't know if they were waiting for the ransom call to come in before they utilized this canine unit or what was going to take place, but you feel like if you know the child was sleeping in her bed at some point, that you bring in that canine unit, if you're trying to figure out how the kidnapper got out of the home, yeah, bring the dog in, let him sniff around the bed and see if the if this canine unit is going to lead you through the home. Right, but that would make some sense. <laughs> and this case has none. The Boulder Police Department does not seem to be in the business of doing things that make sense. No. At 8 a.m., neighbor Scott Gibbons got up and observed a basement door to the Ramsey home was standing wide open. There's been some debate about this open door. Not that it, he saw it and not that it was open. It's just by this point, you've had so many people moving around through the home and checking doors and going about police business or what have you. Well, and this Anybody could have left this door open. Yeah, and this is possibly that door that I was telling you in one of the reports I saw where the cops found a back door open. So this could be the, that back door that you're talking about. Correct. So this is where I think we can back up John Ramsey's statement of what time he was searching the home by himself or the basement by himself. Because he seems to recall, even though he can't figure out the time, that it was before he would have been prepped for the ransom call. The next item on our timeline plays to that. So at 8, 10 a.m., we have Detective Patterson and Detective Linda Arndt arrive at the Ramsey home. Linda Arndt, is this uh, crazy eyes? Yes. Okay. Officer Rick French gave them an updated briefing at this time. We have Steve Thomas's notes that states that the two detectives arrived um, at this time as well. So this seems to be generally confirmed or at least believed by multiple people on the scene. Detective Arndt monitored incoming calls to the Ramsey's residence. That was her first duty. Afterward, Detective Arndt instructed John Ramsey regarding the call. The instructions were how he should handle the call when it comes in. First, to keep talking or keep the caller talking long enough to trace the call. And maybe even more important, demand to talk to John Bonet. Yeah, but why this is all going on, we have the Ramsey's friends that are over to try to help them out. They start cleaning the kitchen. Yeah, some of the notes state that this was the victim's advocates that were cleaning the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Either way, it's it's a big no-no, especially if it would be the advocates that were brought in by the Boulder Police Department. At 8.36 a.m., John Andrew and Melinda Ramsey boarded a Delta flight to Minneapolis. At 9.27 a.m., Detective Byfield contacted Gary Merriman for a list of the employees at Access Graphics. Yeah. Basically, by doing this, they're rounding up people that they think are possible suspects. At 10 a.m., no one, including the Ramseys, mentions to Detective Linda Arndt that the suspected kidnappers failed to call during the designated time period. Right. Steve Thomas very astutely points out a very interesting thing here that, that that's very kind of difficult to put your finger on. And that is the letter, which we are going to dive into. But the letter states that we will contact you tomorrow between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. The problem with that is we do not know what time John Bonet was kidnapped, meaning if the letter was constructed and she was kidnapped before midnight, then 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. tomorrow would be just that very day on the 26th. Right. If it was after midnight, the kidnapper may have meant 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. on the 27th. Right. I mean, this is this is this can't make this stuff up about this case. Regardless, what I find interesting here, though, Captain, is if I'm one of the parents of this missing girl and I've been prepped on a ransom call and how to handle that call, when that time expires, I'm going to be panicking. Why yeah. didn't they call? Why didn't they call? Yeah, do they know they law said they would call here? Yeah. yeah. I'm not going to put any thought into what day they were supposed to call or what day they meant. 
I'm going to go off of, I'm panicked. I haven't heard. I'm supposed to get some instruction on how to get my daughter back. Right. Or I'd use my brain and say, okay, they didn't call. I'm a little worried, but does that mean that they're going to call tomorrow? Is the, you know, is the note stating tomorrow? You see what I mean? Like somebody should mention something. Mm -hmm. According to Steve Thomas's notes um, at 1030, at approximately 1030 is exactly what he states. Detectives Linda Arndt and Fred Patterson, they sealed off John Benet's bedroom. About time. Yeah. It's about time Good that job. you've done that. Way to go. Pat yourself on the back. At 1030 a.m. after doing this, all additional police officers and the victim advocates, this is everyone law enforcement sent to the home other than Linda Arndt, they leave the Ramsey residence. So that means we now have Linda Arndt at the home, one detective, one member of law enforcement, one single person. Yeah. With Patsy Ramsey, John Ramsey, the Whites, the Fernies, and the Reverend. Well, the Ramseys really liked her, though. Even though she has crazy eyes, the Ramseys, it seemed like they felt comfortable with her. Well, I just wanted to point out that we have one law enforcement member here and seven individuals, seven civilians in a big, giant house. There are things working at the police station during this time. Right. However, how could the officers and the other detectives, there's a sergeant amongst them, all decide to leave and only leave one officer there with seven people? This, to me, seems like pure insanity on behalf of the Boulder Police Department and totally unfair to one of their own, unfair to Detective Linda Arndt. Yeah, but she's going to tell two different stories. So I don't, want, I don't think we need to get into too much detail, but... I, it seems like initially she's like, yeah, they were cooperative and I was trying to help them out and they were talking to me. And then it seems like years later she changes her story and that, that that's where she has that famous interview where she's saying, and I was holding my gun and counting my bullets, you know, it's like one, why are you counting your bullets and why are you afraid? None of these people have guns. Yeah. I just think it's, that whole move is totally unfair to Detective Arndt by her fellow officers to leave her there by herself. It's well, too, to be fair, nobody wanted to be seen with her crazy eyes. It's too much for one officer to handle. We got seven people moving around a crime scene. But they're not. Yeah. <laughs> right. But and then on top of that. It still has not been designated a crime scene by law enforcement. I mean, they, yes, they blocked off. Haven't we agreed room. that that's one of the problems? Yes. Big problem. Yeah. That's a big problem. Here's a continued, another misstep yes. by the Boulder police department. Now we're going to leave just one of our officers here to, yeah. Okay. So the thought at the time is, yes, there was a kidnapping. Maybe she doesn't need to be monitoring everybody inside the home, but maybe that should have been in consideration one and two. We've cut off radio communications. Yep. What if the ransom call comes in? You've left 30 yep. minutes after the call was supposed to come in. It just makes, it makes absolutely zero, we absolute have, zero sense. We have one officer there. She'll handle it. Yeah, that makes no sense. Between 1040 a.m. and around noon, John Ramsey is unaccounted for. What this means is that Linda Arndt, the only officer on the scene, does not know where this man is during this time frame. Doesn't he go to check his mail or something? That, is, that was the rumor. That was the story that came out early in this whole big mess. Who gives a shit, Who gives a shit about your mail? Well, that's what people oh, point to. God. People say this man did not care that his daughter was missing at the time, did not care that a ransom call could come in because he left the home to check the mail. Linda Arndt right. kind of makes an assumption here. Remember, she cannot account for him. She accounts for him around noon, she says, when she sees John sitting by himself and he's reading some type of correspondence, some maybe a letter or something she makes the assumption that he left to go get the mail. Okay. We know years later that that is in fact, we can't say in fact, but I would guess very likely untrue that he left the home to get the mail. The mail slot was in the, 
in the front door. Yeah, the makes, mail comes into no the home. Sense. You don't have to leave the home. So he could have very well picked up the mail or just picked something up from his desk, tried to occupy his mind. We don't know. What we do know is he is unaccounted for roughly for an hour. She doesn't know where he is. Linda well, Arndt does not know again, where he is. Again, that, look, that's not the fault of the family. That's the fault of law enforcement for leaving one officer behind not be able to keep an eye on everybody. But it's interesting because the other adults in the home are accounted for during this time. Now, we have Linda Arndt who is left with a cell phone. This is her method that she's been told she needs to use to communicate with her fellow officers. Mm -hmm. During this time, she feels like she's losing control of all the people there, losing control of the scene, if you want to call it that. And she sends losing two control pages. control of her eyebrows and eyes. She wow. sends two pages to officers requesting backup that she would like for them to call. You know, you send a page, they respond. She was going to tell them, I need some additional officers here. I'm outnumbered. And I wonder what made her look. I'm not saying that she's telling one story and then saying another. That's what I said before. But what but that's what it kind of seems like. But maybe there was something that happened happened during being there by yourself that she went wait a second something's not right here and that's when she started calling for backup yeah twice she called well she sent a page both times they went they didn't respond to them she never had the opportunity to ask for backup she's asking for backup captain because she feels she's lost control of the scene she's lost control of the all it these people that are there yeah. she's supposed to babysit them she knows for a fact that one of them, John Ramsey, is unaccounted for sir, for a certain period of time. Yeah. Around 1 o'clock, Heather Cox, she is at the White's home. She answers the phone, and she is told by Priscilla White to bring Burke Ramsey back to the Ramsey home. Uh-huh. Now, at around 1230, again, we have John Ramsey, according to Linda Arndt, sitting by himself. She decides, and again, there's, I apologize, there's several different versions of this story, but she says that around just before one o'clock, she wanted to give John something to do. So she asked John to search the house. Some stories say that she approached Fleet White and asked him to get John to go with him to search the house. Mm -hmm. I actually think these varied stories in this particular situation could be extremely important based off of what people's suspicions will be because of their movements and what people will come to the defense of John Ramsey in those suspicions. Yeah, but really this case should be called John Benet Ramsey, close enough, good enough for jazz, right? I mean, because... Every story has a combating story. Yeah, because the people telling you the story, other than us, they all seem to have an axe to grind. Right. They've they concluded agenda. what happened. They figured out what has happened, and they're going to sell it and spin it to you in that manner. We're going to try to give you the story from all the different angles and let you decide what took place. Yeah. Now... I'm going to really try to sum but, this portion wait, up. But I'm not going to let you decide on her crazy eyes. Definitively, she has crazy eyes. To sum it up here, Captain, in the shortest form, either Arndt asked Fleet White to search the home with John, or she asked John, and then John took Fleet White with him. This is interesting because of what we will learn, and we'll get into that. Eventually, regardless of how this goes down, of who asked who, Steve Thomas says that they were instructed to search the house from top to bottom. However, John opted to head directly to the basement instead. Mm -hmm. According to Steve Thomas's notes, John Ramsey led Fleet White to the basement, where they first went to the train room and examined the broken window, and John said he broke it a few months ago. They searched for glass on the floor. The men next searched a shower stall located in the basement. Mr. Ramsey then noticed a fireplace grate propped in front of a closet, and Mr. White moved the grate 
so the closet could be searched. Upon finding nothing unusual in the closet, the men proceeded to the wine cellar room. 1.04 p.m., this is the time given in Steve Thomas's notes, Mr. Ramsey entered the room first, turned on the light, and upon discovering John Bonet's dead body, he shouted something in regards to that discovery. There is another version out there that states Ramsey shouted actually before turning on the light. This is called into question because remember, we have Fleet White who says he went into that very same room earlier, couldn't find the light, and did not see anything. John Bonet had black duct tape covering her mouth, a cord around her neck that was attached to a wooden garrote, and her hands were bound over her head in front of her. She was covered by a light colored blanket. The blanket covered her torso, but not her head, arms, or legs. John Ramsey ripped the duct tape from John Bonet's mouth and attempted to free her hands of the bindings. Fleet White came running up the stairs yelling, call 911, call 911. He then runs to the back office located on the first floor, grabbing a telephone. But remember, we have Detective Linda Arndt is still in the home at this point. So using the cell phone, she calls 911. And John Ramsey, which is carrying John Bonet up the stairs, he then sets her down. And for some reason, Detective Arndt is going to pick her back up and carry her into a different room, the living room, by the Christmas tree. This is where John Ramsey kneels beside the body and repeatedly says something like, my little angel, over and over again. Friends had to carry Patsy Ramsey because she's too stunned to walk over to the body. Yeah, and the next part I didn't believe. I actually had to hear it from Patsy Ramsey's mouth herself. But she actually asked God to raise her daughter from the dead. Saying you raise Lazarus from the dead, raise my baby. If you want more of The Garage, make sure you check us out on the very free, very awesome Stitcher app. And for our other show, Off the Record, check us out on Stitcher Premium. And for everything true crime, check out truecrimegarage.com. Join us next week for episode three of John Bonet Ramsey. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter. <laughs>